Has everyone else sat down? No. Some people sit, some people don't. Lazy damn actors. <laughs> Mind you, actually, no, I, I usually am wearing a much shorter skirt and I have to make sure that no one can see what I had for breakfast, but I'm okay today. It's, it's a decent length. Um, just want to do one horrible thing before we start having fun. Can we just have a moment of silence for what happened in Pittsburgh and Kentucky this week? Okay. I hate what's happening to the world. It makes me cry. This is supposed to be Deanna Troy Day today because it's National Chocolate Day today. <laughs> I can't celebrate it. This is the year I'm not going to celebrate it. I'm sorry. I just can't. I'm in despair. I'm in despair for what's happening in America. And um, I'm, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, you know I'm very vocal about politics. And I get a lot of shtick. I, I blocked a lot of people this morning. <laughs> Um, but I'm of the opinion that evil will thrive when good people say nothing. So I'm going to speak because it's just gone too far. Just gone too far. Anyway, who's never seen me before in, you know, in the flesh? So to speak. Oh, where the hell have you been for the last 30 years? <laughs> Do you not get out much in London, Ontario? You're busy working the cons? Well, then how the flip haven't you seen me? I'm the convention queen, for goodness sake. If I'm not on stage, I'm at one of these things. Well, okay, it's, that's a good thing for me because um, none of you have heard the jokes before. So I don't have to come up with any new material. Brilliant. Those of you who have heard the jokes before, just, you know, keep quiet until, you know, that question's finished. Um, I, uh, okay, another question for you guys, market research. Who didn't know I was English? Pathetic, really. <laughs> so the reason I had to do an accent on, uh, on TNG was because um, although Pat, you know, Jean-Luc Picard was supposed to be French. I have recently heard Patrick Stewart's French accent. And he sounds like Peter Sellers doing Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> so being as I'm much better at accents, obviously, than old Baldy, oh, excuse me, Sir Old Baldy, um, I was the one that had to come up with an accent because they didn't want two Brits on the bridge. Um, they got them anyway, but, you know, I had to pretend that I wasn't. So, I'll tell, have a little chat and then it's up to you to ask questions, start thinking. You've got a few minutes to think of a question. Try and be original. I know it's hard, it's a Sunday afternoon, you were all out drinking last night, feeling a bit under the weather, I get it, all right. So, we were very excited on TNG when we found out we were gonna be the movie franchise because there's a hierarchy in, well there used to be, not so much anymore, I have to be honest, but back in our day, back in the Middle Ages when we were shooting Star Trek, The Next Generation, um, there was a hierarchy and, you know, TV actors were here. I mean, theater actors are down there. You know, then you get TV actors and then you get movie actors. So we knew we were gonna get treated much better by the studio when we were the movie franchise. So, very exciting, even though, to be honest, TNG could have gone on for years more. They thought that because DS9 got so great numbers for the pilot that they would just inherit our audience and go on. Wrong. So uh, they kind of blew it there a bit, the studio. But anyway, 
Come Christmas of that final season, the movie script arrived for generations. So at the house, at my house, and so, you know, I ripped it open and I started reading it immediately. And I got to the part <laughs> where Troy drives the ship. And I'm going, oh my God, I get to drive the Enterprise. Oh my God, it's fantastic. So I called Michael Dorn, my best friend on Star Trek, who we call Dorney because my husband's called Michael and it just sh you know, saves any confusion. So I called Dorney. I'm like, Dorney, Dorney, have you read the script? I get to drive the Enterprise. And he goes, have you finished the script? And I went, no, finish it and call me back. <laughs> so I finished the script. Not such a happy bunny after I finished reading it. Because I was like, okay, let's look at the history of who drove the Enterprise. The first, first person, I think, was the blind dude. Then the child. Then any chicken red who happened to be passing, here's the keys, go drive the Enterprise, and while you're down there, be nice to Data, because he gets lonely on his own down there. And never a scratch on it until Troy got to drive. In my defense, that planet just came out of nowhere, okay? Just angry, just sexism, horrible people. And then I have to crash it twice. In Nemesis, I had to crash it. But that was under orders from Sir Old Baldy because he told me to crash it. So uh, I just did as I was told. So I'm watching, no, I'm watching the movie. I'm, I'm sitting at the premiere watching Generations. And a lot of stuff happened on Generations. Like, um, okay, when the, sh you know, when the bridge was destroyed, you know, this was pre-CGI, so we actually had to destroy the bridge. And so you really only want to do it once, because if you have to do it more than once, they have to rebuild the bridge. So you rehearse, we rehearsed that scene for hours. You know, the, uh, all the stunt men are out there with their protractors and their slide rules, figuring out all the angles, and they're actually planting real explosives, a little bit, I mean, not a lot, but a bit of explosive, and they pack, they pack the, each thing with, with burnt cork so that if it does hit you, it doesn't take your eye out, you know. And uh, basically, let's just do it once. So we get finally rehearsed that scene to death. Everyone knows what they're doing. The stuntmen know that they're gonna go flying through the air. You know, all the stuff is figured out. So take one. So I'm sitting in my chair and it, David Carson, who was directed the movie, another Brit. See, the Americans think they won that war. I'm not so sure, you know. Anyway, when it comes to Star Trek, anyway. So, action. So, all starts kicking off, there's things exploding, there's stuntmen flying through the air. My lovely Tracy Coco, who was driving, she gets exploded out of her seat, she's dead. Riker says, Troy, take the helm. I run down, because Troy runs like a girl. And uh, I sat in the seat for about this long before I leapt out of it screaming and David's like, cut, cut, what the, Marina? And I'm like, excuse me, your majesty. I said, but when I sat in that, when Tracy vacated the chair, burning embers fell into it and I have burnt my bum and I've got a hole in my spacesuit. Well, we had to do take two, five hours later, because they had to rebuild the bridge. And it was the only time in seven years where for all those five hours, I was sitting alone in my trailer because the rest of my fellow thespians hated me. 
stupid marina, stupid, stupid marina. So anyway, there I was, sitting on my own. Finally, we get to do take two. And David comes up to me and he goes, look you, I don't care if the chair's in flames. You're going to sit in it and you're going to stay in it. I went, yes, sir, absolutely, yes, sir. So, take two. Sitting there, action. Tracy goes, stuntmen flying. Riker says, Troy, take the helm. I run down like a girl. And when I got there, I went, you know what? I'm just going to be safe than sorry. <laughs> I could feel the hate. I could just feel it emanating from behind me. And I just looked up at David and I'm like, cut it. It's film, actual film, that you can cut and edit around it, right? So I managed to get away with it, but um, yeah. You don't see this stuff, but this is the fun stuff that we all get to experience when we're filming, you know, it's... Uh... Mind you, you guys watch so many shows about the making of stuff in Hollywood that you probably know more about it than we do. You definitely know more about Star Trek than I do because I'm watching sports. That's what I do. I'm the perfect woman for every, any man but my husband. Because I watch sports all day and I'm a really good cook. So, but my husband's watching Gold Rush and Naked and Afraid and Pawn Stars and all those shows. So we don't have TV in common. We have to have a lot of TVs in my house. So, okay, now it's your turn. You have to ask me questions. Put your hands up. There's one right there. Hello. Hello, my love. Welcome to Canada again. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your performance in Gargoyles. Thank you. And I was wondering what it was like for you to work on that. I enjoyed Gargoyles. Um, I have to be honest, voice acting is my least favorite form of acting. Because these days, when you do voice acting, you're sitting in a sound booth with headphones on, not relating to anybody. Uh, doesn't do it for me, to be honest. Um, but Gargoyles, we recorded it like a radio play. So we were all in the room at the same time, or as many of us as you know, we could get in the room at the same time. And so it was a lot of fun, because you can react to other people. You can you know, see expressions, do all that stuff. Um, have to be honest, I don't think I'm a brilliant voice actor. I don't do voices. I have one voice, but I do accents. But the voice actors who do it like for a living, and that's what they do, they're brilliant. They really are. I mean, I remember there was a line in Gargoyles. It was just one line, and the director, um, Jamie, said, I, I, need this I need this line to, so to sound like old Scottish guy who sounds like a dog when he speaks. And three people put their hands up. And I'm like, really? You have that in your repertoire at the tip of your fingers? But they do. They're amazing. But like I said, I'm not, I don't think I'm really good at voice acting. Um, I know a lot of people love Demona. She actually was voted the number one afternoon Disney villain. And so I'm very proud of her. But uh, um, I think I enjoyed playing her because Marina is actually much more like Demona than she is Deanna. The only thing Marina and Deanna really have in common is we're the same height. <laughs> yeah, I'm much meaner than Deanna. Yes, love. Hello, I'm Hello. from St. Anne's Catholic Secondary School in Clinton. And my students were wondering if you had any advice on, number one, how to best get into the industry. Right. And what was your favorite parts of being part of the industry as far as TV versus movies? Um, and if they should get into it. Okay. Whenever young people come up to me and say, um, I want to go into show, I want to be an actor, I always say, is there anything else that you enjoy just as much? And if there is, do that. It is a... You know, it's a really tough business, show business. You, see, you know, people think it's really glamorous. It's not glamorous. The only glamorous thing about show business is if you have an opportunity to, to, to do a red carpet, that's glamorous, okay? We all know that's really glam. 
but the actual day-to-day -day work is really hard. The hours are really long. Um, uh, financially, salaries are going down. They're not going up. I'm earning in real terms less than I was 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, it's not that, you know, thankfully, since the hashtag Me Too movement, when Hollywood changed overnight, uh, there's not a single producer or director who would dare to sexually abuse or, or um, any way abuse a female actress now. Um, they know that they'd be in really deep trouble. But when I was coming through the business, when I was a young actress, it was accepted. If you couldn't, if you couldn't deal with the sexual harassment, then don't be an actress. Really, it was as simple as that. It was, it was totally accepted for women that it was part of the business. I mean, I've been sexually abused, I've been sexually assaulted, I've been um, abused in other ways, uh, verbally, psychologically. Um, I've been told, you know, you're fat. Yeah. I used to get phone calls. Do you want the good news or the bad news? Good news is your work was great. Bad news is you look fat. We pay you a lot of money to look good. Hung up the phone. That's how women were treated in Hollywood. Thank the Lord that has stopped now, literally overnight. But, and people have said to me, why didn't you speak out? <laughs> people have said to me, you know, why didn't you speak out at the time? A lot of men, I'm sorry guys, but you just don't get it because you're men and not women. Um, a lot of people say, you know, why didn't you speak out at the time? Because I would never have worked again. Never. I would have been blacklisted. And I wanted to be an actress from the age of three. So I wasn't gonna let some jerk who didn't know how to behave appropriately ruin the dream that I had had since I was three years old. So I kept quiet. Plus, I'm really old now and most of them are dead that did it to me. So there's kind of no point. But um, so I would say that to your students, if there's something else that you do as well and you really love doing, do that. Um, and the other thing I would say is get a training. A lot of actors in Hollywood have no training. They think, oh, I just want to be a movie star. There's not a single British actor who became an actor to make money because we don't make money in England. We're usually starving artists, you know. Um, we become actors for all sorts of psychological, you know, reasons. We're so messed up, really. Actors are really mad as a box of frogs. We're all crazy. Um, but get a training. And the best training is the theater. If you can do it on stage, you can do it anywhere. So that's what I would suggest to your students. And please don't encourage them to be actors. Okay, all right. Next question. Mind you, I say that and everyone told me no my whole life. Everyone told me, don't be an actress, don't be an actress, don't be an actress. And the more they told me no, the more I was determined to do it. So it depends on the personality of the students. Yes, Hi. love. Hello. So, uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one, what is Brent Spinner like behind Spiner, the scenes? Spiner. Spiner, Spiner. Okay, Sorry. English grammar lesson. <laughs> when it's one N and an E, it's I. If it was Spinner, it would be double N. Data. There ends the English grammar lesson. I do despair. What kind of education are you getting these days, really? Terrible. It's pathetic. Scoot, teacher, teacher. They don't learn English grammar anymore in schools. That's no, ridiculous. Okay, the only time you learn grammar is if you learn a different language, right? We've been doing the translations. I know, go on. So what is he like behind the scenes? What is he like? Yeah. He's funny. Actually, he's the funniest one of all of us. And we're a very funny cast. I mean, we laughed nonstop for seven years. I mean, literally laughed. But Brent is really, really smart. And I think when you're really, really smart, the smarter you are, the funnier you are if you're a funny person. Um, I mean, we had a director in the first season, Canadian, sorry, a Canadian director in the first season, no names, who directed two shows and then he refused to ever come back because we were too unruly. 
And that was in the first season. He should have come back in the seventh. He would have been screaming from the stage. We were very unruly. Um, none of us were what they call method actors. Uh, method actors are people who stay in character all the time, even when they're not acting. Um, they are a pain in the butt. Uh, none of us were method actors. And the directors who understood how we worked loved us because it was a very happy set. There was no stress, there, was no, there were no egos, there was no, I'm going to my trailer and I'm not coming out. None of that happened at all on TNG. We would be laughing and joking until the director said action, and then, as soon, and then we'd do our stuff, and then as soon as he said cut, we'd start yakking again. It's not the way usually things are done in Hollywood, but that was the way it was on TNG, and that was why we all loved each other so much, and that was why we had that chemistry. And I'm sorry, no other Star Trek show, in my opinion, ever had the chemistry that we had on TNG. Because no other cast did, there, it didn't happen in any other cast that the whole cast loved each other. There were issues, no names again, but there were issues in some of the other shows. We didn't have issues. We had issues about bad craft service, that was all. Yes, love. Hi, um, I was wondering, uh, you said you weren't quite like Deanna Troy, but what did you take away from her character, if anything? From a couple the show? of spacesuits. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, because we're not method actors, I didn't really take anything away. People say, well, did it make you more, you know, tolerant, blah, blah, blah? I'm like, nah, not really. I was trying to make Deanna more like Marina all the time, and the writers wouldn't let me. Yeah. Because, you know, actually, when, when we first started, and, you know, you're all sitting here now thinking, oh, we love TNG. But when we first started, you know, the fans were not happy. They were like, how dare you try to take the place of our heroes? We don't want another Star Trek. And it wasn't really until about the third season that the popularity really kicked in. I mean, I would go to conventions and get hostility from the 30 people who'd come to see me, you know? No, really. So, um, it, you know, we, we, it took a while. It took a while to win you all over, but, you know, it, we did it. We did it. I mean, even Patrick, sorry, but when I first got the job and my English friends said, oh, you're going to be working with Patrick Stewart, I, I had never worked with him. I, I had only ever done one show with the RSC, and that was a musical, so I never got to meet him. And my friends who had worked with him at the Royal Shakespeare Company were like, Marina, you can't be you because he's very serious. He's all about the work. You can't mess about, you know, like you usually do. And he was for about three, four months and then we pretty much beat that out of him. And now he's the silliest one of all of us. As those of you who follow him on Twitter see when he's with Ian McKellen, they're like a couple of kids. So yeah, we, we changed him for the better. Yes, we did. Next question. Uh, hello, good Where afternoon. Oh, oh, over there, hi. Good afternoon and thank you for your time today. Uh, my two-part question is, there was an episode of Family Guy where Stewie uh, made uh, the Star Trek cast hang out with him. I was wondering, what was it like working on Family Guy and do you think the Star Trek cast was deliberately being annoying on purpose so he'd hate Star Trek? and uh, never summon them again, or what's your theory Well, on? listen, Seth MacFarlane loves Star Trek. Seth is like one of our biggest fans. In fact, come on, the Orville. The Orville is, a, is an homage to TNG. Come on, let's be honest. I mean, when the first episode aired, I sent him a text saying, you know, congratulations, and he's texted me back, and he's like, well, you know that it's because of you guys. And I'm like, yeah, that's why we love you so much. Um, but he's a huge, T actually he's a huge Star Trek fan, but TNG's his favorite. But he knows everything about Star Trek. So he just, he just wanted us to be on Family Guy. Wasn't, I have to say Seth, not that much fun because it was one of those situations where I was sitting on my own in a sound booth, you know, acting with myself. So, um, 
I think that was because it kind of didn't work out with our schedules that we would be all together. So, it, it, you know, it was very different. But I have never seen Family Guy. Um, I have never seen Gargoyles. I haven't seen all the episodes of TNG because I find myself very uninteresting to watch on TV. Um, and like I said, I would much rather be watching sports. So, um, you, like I said, you guys definitely know more about my show than I do. So please don't ask me any technical questions. Is that a technical question? Because I'm not a technical person. I was like, how does that make you feel? You know, I was one of those Freudian psychologists who sat there and didn't contribute anything to people's well-being. So anyway, next here? question. Over here? Yes, love. So it was a pleasure meeting you today. Thank you, ditto. So, question for you is that what has been and what do you hope will be your greatest social impact? My, my greatest? Social impact. My, my social impact? You know, I'm just an actress um, who got, was, fortunate to be cast in one of the best jobs ever. Um, and at the time when we were filming, we thought we were just having fun making a really good TV show. It's only now in retrospect with, you know, hindsight being 2020, when people come up to me at conventions or when I meet them on the street or wherever, and they say things like, you changed my life. You saved my life. I mean, the times I've heard, you saved my life. Um, I, I, I now realize, you know, 30 years on, yeah, I was 12 when we started. Um, <laughs> I now realize 30 years on that we really did impact people's lives. I was, uh, we were doing one of our reunion conventions a couple of years ago, which we do every five years, you know, for the anniversary of our show. And there was a veteran in the audience and he wheeled himself to the front of the stage and he had been a medic in Iraq or Afghanistan, I can't remember where. And he'd had both his legs amputated above the knee. So he was on like stumps. And his nickname, he said, my name's Feet. Because he didn't have any, right? So I knew immediately the spirit of this man was extraordinary. And he said to all of us, TNG saved my life. I had to have 150 surgeries. And the only thing that kept me going was watching TNG. Well, we were all in tears. And so I realize now that I, I was part of something bigger than me. I was part of something that really did have an effect on people in a good way. And it's one of the greatest blessings and privileges in my life that I was involved in Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm very proud of it now, so proud of it now. Yeah. Oh, I made myself cry. Okay, yes, love. Hello, and just, it was great to meet you as well today. Yes. Sorry. Um, some of my favorite episodes with you were with uh, Majel Barrett. Was she great to work with? You talked about chemistry. Majel Barrett was as mad as a box of frogs. She really was. Bonkers. But, you know, boss's wife, so when she showed up, as I said, we were very badly behaved. So when she showed up, we were like, oh gosh, the boss's wife is coming. We better be good. Just for one episode, we better behave ourselves. Well, she showed up and we realized she was wackier than the rest of us put together and she fit right in. And um, I adored her because the Roddenberries kind of adopted me because I was fresh off the boat. I had literally been in the country in America for six months to the day when I got cast on Star Trek. So they always made sure I was, in, you know, I was always invited to their house for Thanksgiving and Christmas and Oscar parties and everything. You know, they, because that first year, you know, the only people really that I knew in America was the cast. 
And Majel and Jean just included me in their family. And actually, Rod Roddenberry still calls me sis, and I still call him bro. And um, again, huge blessing that I got to know Jean, not as the big bird of the galaxy, but as just regular Jean Roddenberry, who was a scamp. He was a bit of a scamp, a bit of a naughty boy, but um, a genius, absolute genius. So I feel very honored to be kind of included in the Roddenberry family. Yeah. Next question. Hello. Oh, right. Not too far away. Uh, thanks for coming to the Mini-Me of London. And uh, I just wanted to ask about typecasting. I know that some folks have a difficulty with that. Obviously, you've embraced it. But at what point did you realize when you were in the TNG genre that you would become a forever a part of that and then defining the future career that you would have? Well, th everyone, it's, you know what, people yeah, think that just it. people on Star Trek get typecast. They d it's not, it's every part, every show. The pe when Cheers finished, they were typecast, you know. When MASH finished, they were typecast. When you've been on a successful show, people always want to keep you in that pigeonhole. Um, and I fought against it a little bit um, after C TNG finished. And then I realized, well, do I want to work or not? So then I ended up doing pretty much every uh, sci-fi show out there. And then I did Crash. I was in the movie Crash, playing an Iranian lady. And then suddenly I wasn't typecast anymore because I got to play Middle Easterners. You see, in Hollywood, white women a lot are not allowed to age. But ethnic women and black women can. So I've been working. You know, I kept working and I play, you know, listen, instead of sending Jared to the Middle East, they should send me because I play a lot of Arabs, but I'm also the head of Mossad on NCIS. I'm on both sides. I could be the peace talks. But um, yeah, I don't feel that I'm tap typecast anymore. I really don't. Um, I actually lightened my hair. Uh, my hair hasn't been this light ever before. Um, and I like it, but then I thought, hang on a minute. You play a lot of Arabs. You better go a little darker again because you're doing yourself out of a lot of work being this light. So this isn't going to last for very long. Um, I'm never going to go black again because girls, <laughs> black hair and age don't go together. Black hair makes you look about 10 years older. So I um, won't be black again, but it'll be a bit darker than it is now. I love somebody came up to me yesterday and he, he bought an autograph and he goes, is this you? <laughs> and I was like, mm-hmm. Have you heard of hair dye? He was like, Actually, my favorite is when I sign an autograph for someone. And this has happened, I'm not joking. Uh, what does that say? And I'm like, did you just ask for my autograph? Yeah. But what does that say? I always say it says, Patrick Stewart, go away. <laughs> Honestly, some people are too stupid to live, really. You know, my husband says that I couldn't, shouldn't call people stupid. But my answer to that is, well, if you don't tell them, how are they going to know? <laughs> really? Next question. Thank you. Yes, love. Look, call us whatever you want. So what was it like working with Jonathan? Well, can you tell us what it was like working with Jonathan Frakes on okay, the latest stop, Star Trek? Stop, 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 This is one of the dumb questions, right? They are filming me. What is it like to work with fill in the gap? What the fuck do you think I'm going to say? Tell okay. us about the Orville, or the latest Star Trek. Bear in mind that I said we laughed for seven years, we all loved each other. How's the new crew? What's it? Then how's the new crew on the Orville, or the new Star Trek? Oh, you mean on Orville? Yes. Or on Discovery? Well, no, Orville. On Orville. What we Which think is the new I am going to be in an episode of the Orville in the second season, by the way. Um... 
it's not the same. Uh, you know, I, I keep talking about this, but it's because it's true. TNG, it was like lightning in a bottle. It just, this magical thing happened with the cast. On the first day, not even a filming of the makeup and hair tests. I'm sitting in the makeup trailer, getting my hair done or whatever, and then the door opens and Jonathan Frakes walks in. I've never met him before. And I swear to God, the atmosphere in the room changed. He's a force of nature, Jonathan. And he is also my favorite director of all time. And I've been doing this for 42 years. So um, he's a wonderful, brilliant, loving, smashing human being. It's funny, I've never been asked this before, but in the last week, I've been asked it twice, which is kind of bizarre. Was there anything going on between Jonathan and Marina? No. He was already with Jeannie Francis, and I met my husband in the first season hiatus, so very early on, we were both spoken for. Um, but yes, we had a chemistry, and the chemistry was magical, but that was purely because it was just love, you know? I loved working with everyone on TNG. I got, you know, different things from every single person I worked with. Um, yeah, but that's not a smart question because no one's going to say they were idiots, I hated their guts, you know, I never want to work with them again. You can't say that, even if it's true. I know. Yes, love. Um, well, experiencing you in person for the first time, uh, you're kind of spicy. Uh, yes. <laughs> so my question is, is in early on in the series, you were, um, I mean, you hung around a lot and you were... He's trying like to the, not. He's trying to put his question without insulting me. Right, right, right. right I know. I know. <laughs> you're like the damsel in distress. I know where distress. you're going with this. Right. But later on, we see episodes like Face of the Enemy and Disaster, and I'm wondering if that was you, Marina. No, no. No, you just do. No. What you're told. You know, I just think they. Listen, I used to go to conventions, and people would say to me, "We think Deanna Troy's really boring, but we love Marina." Like I wasn't going to be offended at that, right? Actually, it's true. You can offend me. I am unoffendable. You can piss me off, and then I turn into the Hulk. But you can offend me, because you're not going to call me any name my mother hasn't called me already. You know? So, uh, right, girls? So, um, no, I had nothing to do with it. I had nothing to do with how I looked. I had nothing to do with what I wore. I had nothing to do with what I said. But yes, the character evolved. I think the character... Listen, you get more stuff depending on how popular you are. So as I got more and more popular, my parts got better and better. And that's the bottom line of it, really. Run, Tammy, run. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yes, love. Hey, Marina. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about some of your other work as well on Stargate SG-1. Uh, getting back to accents, as you started the panel about accents, you did a lovely Russian accent in that episode called Watergate as Dr. Markova. Uh, just wondering, what was it like working with the cast of SG-1? Okay, well, when you've been on TNG, which, come on, be honest, was the most successful sci-fi sci show ever, right? Whenever you went to visit another sci-fi show, they treated me like I was the Queen of England. Really, it was fantastic. And, I, and Amanda Tapping and I bonded immediately. We're still, you know, I love Amanda. Um, but when I, when I was offered the job, they said, can you do a Russian accent? And I went, yeah. And so I went on the set. And after the first take, Michael Greenberg, the producer, came up to me and said, uh, could you tone down the Russian a little bit? You're a little too Russian. Oh, I said, oh, you don't want Russian, you want Hollywood Russian, which is what they wanted, yeah, yeah. But it was so much fun, really a lot of fun. Actually, there's one story. Um, Richard Dean Anderson, sweetheart, absolute sweetheart. And uh, at that time, his little girl was, I think, about two years old. So it was in his contract that he would finish work at six o'clock so that he could go home and like maybe bathe her and put her to bed, read her a story, whatever. 
which I think is fantastic because, um, you know, his family life was as important to him as his career. And uh, so it was six o'clock and I was doing a scene with him and I saw his driver had showed up and we had shot his dialogue and now the camera was gonna turn around and shoot my dialogue. So I said, Ricky, you know, um, your car's here, so if you wanna go, that's fine. You know, you can go, don't feel, and he went, oh no, Marina, he said no. When we get an actress of your caliber, I stay. Well, excuse me, how to make someone so nervous they can't speak, really? I swear, I must have got my lines wrong 20 times, and I think he's thinking, oh, for God's sake, this woman's awful. But um, he made me nervous by saying that, and uh, so I really screwed up afterwards. Now, another thing that happened on Stargate they ha because it's supposed to be the Air Force, right? They had real Air Force dudes on the set. So remember that thing where I had to jump out of the airplane? I had to jump out of the airplane? Okay, well, the Air Force dude comes up to me and he goes, uh, that's a real parachute you're wearing. You know, the totally bona fide, absolute real thing. Well, apparently, I wasn't very good at jumping out of aeroplanes. It's because it's not something I ever want to do in my life. There is not enough money in the world for me to jump out of an aeroplane. After I, apparently, you know, so the director would say, Marina, watch Ricky. Watch how Ricky does it. He can do the jumping. And I'm like, watching him, and then I'd have to do it again. Well, after I jumped out of this aeroplane about 10 times, and my back was killing me, I went up to the Air Force dude and I said, you know, it's a real parachute in here, right? He went, oh yeah. I said, why? I'm not deploying the parachute. All you've done is do my back in. You could have filled it with newspaper. Who would know? Yeah, they weren't very happy with that. But yeah, I just tell it like it is and I will yell at anybody, I don't care. I'm not scared of anyone on the planet except my sister-in-law. So, uh, yeah, I'm not scared of any of you. Next question. Tammy, where are you? I'm here. Okay. I got it. Who's it? you? Yeah? Uh, welcome to London again. Thank you. Our London. It's so funny when you say welcome to London because I'm <laughs> yeah, from yeah. London. Know you know, the original that. one. I have noticed, though, that when you have all these English names, have the good sense to pronounce them right. It's Pall Mall, not Paul Mall. It's Leamington, not Leamington. It's Regina, not Regina, for God's sakes. Yes, love. Okay, we'll try. Um, I'm wondering what some of your favorite episodes of Next Generation were. Did you okay. have any favorites? Yeah, I do. Actually, because I'm such an unselfish and giving actress, one of my favorite episodes is one that I'm not in very much, and that is Measure of a Man. To me, that was like the perfect Star Trek episode, because I loved courtroom dramas, I love Law and Order, and uh, so to me it combined, you know, and we were, we, Data was on trial to see if he was a sentient being. I thought it was the perfect episode. Um, and also, because I wasn't in it very much, I got days off. So definitely one of the favorites. You know, when you're first cast in a series, first season, you look through, you look through the scripts to see how many lines you have, and you get really nervous when you're not in it very much. Come second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth season, you're like, oh, thank God, I'm only in one scene. I get some days off. It all changes. Because we're working sometimes 18 hours a day. We really are. I mean, the shortest day was like 14 hours. So, and then they want to shoot your close up at three o'clock in the morning when you look like something the cat dragged in. Really, yeah. Look where I'm going, over here. Huh? Where's she going? Oh, hello. Hi, how you doing? We're, we've got the vendors joining in. <laughs> We're all nerds here. <laughs> I was wondering from I'm, uh, I'm, I went to college for theater arts, and I was wondering, the biggest transition from theater to 
being on a film set, what is the biggest transition for you or that you've, okay. that you've experienced? The biggest transition from going from theater to film is um, in the theater, you use all of it. You know, you make, you do hand gestures, you use your body. On TV and film, it's all in the eyes. And don't pull a lot of faces because it looks really weird. So when you're doing film, you have to think it. And when you're on stage, you have to think it and act it with everything. So that's the biggest difference. And that is the hardest transition, actually. A lot of theater actors, like, a, and I'm one of them. I put my hand up. First season of Star Trek, I was like, oh my God, what was I thinking? Unwatchable, unwatchable. Um, I was amazed I still had a job after the pilot. I watched Encounter at Farpoint and I thought, how do I still have a job? It was like Star Trek meets Sophie's Choice. It was off, way too dramatic. Um, but that's what you learn is you have to bring it all in and make it much more internal when you're doing screen work. But good question. Yes, love. Hello, you think I'm you? really funny, don't you? I do. I you think do. You're You've been laughing your head off. I can see you. <laughs> I think you're wonderful. Thank um, you. I do have a question just on a personal level. You've mentioned sports a few times. What teams are you interested in? Uh, this is my team in England, Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Um, I have supported the team for 50 years. I have waited 50 years for the team that we have now. It's like being a Cleveland Browns fan, really. Um, but they're not good yet, but Spurs are good now. Um, I also watch NFL, I, and I watch, co I, okay, I'll tell you my sports. I watch English football, American football, college ball on Saturday, tennis, um, and at the business end of the season, like now, I'm watching the World Series because I'm a Dodger fan, which we're gonna, it's a bit rubbish, they're gonna lose tonight. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, they're, they're my three main sports. People try to, and people say, I know I'm in Canada and the hockey thing, but I really don't have room in my life for any more sports. I think my husband would divorce me if I found another sport to watch. Plus, I never know where the puck is. It all goes too fast for me. So my, I do like the fact they beat each other up. I find that very exciting. I do like that part of hockey, a bit of bruising action, yeah. They actually mean it. I mean, they like really fight, right? Yeah. That's why none of them have got any teeth, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that is one of my prerequisites for a man. He's got to have all his own teeth. That's one of them. Well, that's one, that's on, first on the list. Next question. Over here. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Uh, the episode where uh, yourself... Uh, Data and uh, O'Brien were possessed by the aliens. Yeah, and you had to do your own stunt uh, And you actually injured yourself. Were I did. Any, were there any like lasting effects from that? No, did, no, 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 I, I, I um, bruised my coccyx quite badly Because you know when you're doing a show and you're you're the psychologist You really don't get to do a lot of different stuff so whenever anything different would come up, I go, oh yeah, let me, and they say, okay, they came up. Uh, Marina, you just need to fall over. Do you want to do that or do you want a stunt woman? Oh, I can fall over, God's sakes. How hard it is to fall, how hard is it to fall over? Well, I fell straight back, literally like a board. And it hurt because you know, that's why God invented stump people, so that actors wouldn't hurt themselves. I mean, this is, I get really cross with Tom Cruise. I do. It's like, don't do your own stunts. First of all, you're no spring chicken anymore. Let's get real, right? And second of all, he broke his arm on the last move, on, on whichever Mission Impossible just came out, 52, whichever one it was. Um, so that means the whole crew is out of work until he comes back and he's fixed. Well, that's just selfish. You know, you're putting people out of work by doing your own stunts. So I don't approve of it. Ever since then, I don't approve of actors doing their own stunts. That's what, stunt, like I said, that's what stuntmen are for. Yes, love. 
Thank you so much for coming. It's so exciting. Thank for you to have for you coming here. to see me. We're huge fans. Um, in regards to your um, interest in social issues, other than Measure of a Man, did you have an issue that Star Trek tackled? Because Star Trek tends to tackle social issues. Which episode did you find tackled a social issue really well? Um, oh, blimey, you've put me on the spot. You've put me on the spot. Was there an episode? There was an episode, I think, called Symbiosis about um, drugs. Wasn't that the one about drugs? And how one society was keeping another society drugged, right? To me, that correlates, teacher, with what's happening in schools right now. I'm not a Scientologist, but I don't believe we should drug children. I think it's bad teaching, I really do. If you, it's basically teachers who can't control the kids in their class, and so they put them on, they say, oh, ADHD. I mean, come on. This is what I call one of the new diseases. When I was in school, we had good kids and bad kids. I was one of the bad kids, right? But there was no question of putting me on drugs. I got sent to detention, right? And so, uh, that, to me, uh, really kind of resonated because I think we use drugs way too much. And basically, it's because, don't get me started, the pharmaceuticals, the oil companies, and the insurance companies make the rules in America. And the pharma, big pharma, wants everyone taking some kind of medication so they can make huge profits, and I don't approve. Next question. I've lost Tammy again. Oh, there she is. All right. What, what was it like to be on the last episode of Enterprise? Oh, yeah, right. Okay. So, we didn't, Jonathan and I didn't really, well, first of all, oh, I have to awesome. preface this with the first time they asked me to be on Voyager, I said no. And then the second time they asked me to be on Voyager, before I could say no, they said, you'll be working with Dwight Schultz. And I went, oh, all right. I like Dwight. I like, all right, I'll do it. So when they asked me to do Enterprise, before I could say no, they said, Jonathan said yes. So I had a chat. I was like, do you know what? I would love to work with my Johnny again. So I said yes. And it wasn't until after we had shot it that, and we saw the press about it that we found out that the cast were not exactly over the moon that two TNG actors were on their show in the last episode. And I don't blame them. Because really, it was a TNG episode. Because Riker and Troy were real, and the Enterprise cast were holograms. So I understood where they were coming from. However, on a purely selfish level, I was there on day one of Star Trek The Next Generation, which was basically the reboot of Star Trek after the original show. The very last shot on Enterprise was Jonathan and I walking off the holodeck. And then they turned the lights out. So historically, I'm thrilled because it's like a little bit of Star Trek history that I'm involved with. Um, but as a, as, a, as a friend to the Enterprise, and I am friends with all the Enterprise cast, I totally understood where they were coming from. It would be like if we were doing um, all good things, and uh, they said, oh, by the way, Shatner's going to be in it. We'd have been pissed, and I get it. Totally get it. Plus, they couldn't find... Oh, that was the other thing. They had forgotten that I wore a wig. So when, you know, before I went in for my costume fitting and stuff, I said, well, so where's the... You know, find the wig. Where's the wig? They couldn't find the wig. So I was furious because they gave me a really bad, cheap nylon wig to wear on Enterprise. It was all horrible. And um, then I, I moved houses... And when I was going through all my stuff, I had the wig. 
was one of the things that f fell into my bag as I was leaving the set. Yeah, the people who asked if they could take stuff were told no. So I didn't ask. I just took it. I actually took my director's chair, the whole chair. You're supposed to take the bit of fabric in the back of the chair that has the name of the show and then your name on it. That's like your souvenir. But I thought, this is high director's chair. If I'm ever doing, you know, a red carpet or a premiere when the makeup artist comes to my house, I'll be the right height. It's a handy height, you know, for hair and makeup. So I'm walking off the set with my chair and I ran into one of the producers who said, Marina, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking my chair. She goes, Marina, you can't take the chair. Just take the back out of the chair like everybody else. I'm like, no, I want the chair. Marina, I want the chair. I'll take the damn chair. <laughs> so I went back. I thought that was easy. So I went into observation and I thought one of these comfy lilac purple chairs, that'd be really nice for watching TV. <laughs> and they were on wheels. And I ran into Mary again. What are you doing? I, I just thought I'd take this chair too. Put the chair back, Marina. But I did get some stuff. I did, I did. Brent is still pissed off at me because he's a good guy. He's a goody two-shoes. He asked. He was told no. He has nothing. It's like, if you want it, come and get it. And like the NRA said, you'll have to rip it out of my cold, dead hands. Really. Okay, I think Tammy's hovering because I'm supposed to be done now. Um, and I've, oh, I've gone over by a long way. Never mind. Who's on next? No one important. I okay, don't know, fine. But I was just so, um, <laughs> no, no, wait, wait. No, I've got to say goodbye. Fine, of course. I just want to say before I go, and those of you who've seen me before have heard this before, but I'm never going to stop saying it, so suck it up. Um, a lot of people in show business forget or don't think about it or don't realize or never go to that place that the only reason that successful actors have a blessed life and believe me, we have a blessed life. I've been poor, very poor. There's a big difference between my life back then and my life now, right? It's because the audience, the fans, turn their TV sets on, or pay money to go and see a movie, or buy, or down, I don't even buy CDs anymore, do you? I mean, I do, because I'm a Luddite, but you download music or whatever now. Every successful person in show business owes their success to their fans. So I want to thank you for my house, my car, <laughs> my American husband, my dogs, the clothes that I'm wearing, everything I have, I owe to you. Thank you for turning your TV sets on for seven years. Thank you for going to see three and a half movies. <laughs> Let that sink in. Thank you. Um, if I am ever not appreciative, you have my permission to punch me in the face. God bless everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 London Comic Con. Please like, comment and subscribe to see more and let us know below what you think of this video. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.